Starting this video, let's go ahead and look at a few basic definitions, starting with the word guys. According to Oxford Languages, it states that the definition for guys is an external form, appearance, or manner of presentation, typically concealing the true nature of something. Then we have disguise, which, again, according to Oxford Languages on Google, it states to give someone or oneself a different appearance in order to conceal one's identity. So I wonder where the uh, difference between dis guys and just guys comes in. Either way, they seem to be the same word, which we don't need to go into the reason why that's very odd. But either way, it's all about concealment of true identity. Then we have the well-known cover inside of a covert operation. In Google, from Wikipedia, it states a cover in foreign military or police, human intelligence, or counterintelligence is the ostensible identity and slash or role or position in an infiltrated organization assumed by a covert agent during a covert operation. Now that explanation is very rudimentary and only addresses one component of covert operations and cover. And as many people know, you can have whole places and organizations that are specifically constructed to provide this sort of cover. So it's not an infiltration in an organization if that organization has been actually constructed for the purposes of covert operation. From QuoteFancy.com, it states from a Fennel Hudson quote that Playing safe, hiding among the masses, will rarely get you noticed. One of the things that is necessary for providing cover is to avoid looking at the content of someone's character, who they are. So naturally, they come up with the people that perpetuate these sort of covert operations, usually with sinister ends. They don't want people looking at their character. And so they state that character attacks are something that's bad and shouldn't be done. They do this in a couple different ways, but let's go ahead and look at the one from the so-called Department of Philosophy, which is a .edu URL. So that's pretty funny. Anyway, it states that attacking the person, this fallacy occurs when instead of addressing someone's argument or position, you irrelevant irrelevantly attack the person. Now, if you are relevantly attacking someone, as in the trustworthiness of what they're saying, or the fact that what they're saying is an attempt to subvert things or cause conflict, you are, in technically speaking, addressing someone's argument. However, they would say that you are involved, involving yourself in a character attack irrelevantly. That is how the game's played. Because a character attack is not actually something that's bad, and it's not a fallacy. This is specifically ejected into the curriculum of philosophy because they don't want the examining of character. Somebody's character speaks to their honor what they're capable of. Do they have a track record, a history of misconduct? That has to do with someone's character. Instead of stating whether or not, and it's interesting because these people actually do this all the time. They don't want you doing it to them, but they do this to everyone. Instead of addressing what someone says, the content of what they're saying, they always ask for credentials and ask why you specifically should be talking about this topic. They only want people with their titles they control speaking on any sort of subject that, according to their own definition, 
would constitute an attack of someone's character. They're stating that your character is faulty if you do not have a college degree, some sort of official paid position within a, quote, competent authority. All of that has to do with character. So, the character of the individual at hand, just like a story character in a book. Uh, in a book, a character's a character is made up of all of the different components and aspects that the individual portrays. That's what a character is in any sort of sto fixed, uh, story of fiction or whatnot. So if the ad hominem fallacy is in fact something bad, well, they perpetuate it all the time. So clearly they don't actually think it's bad. They only form it, form it, or form this into the wording they use <laughs> because they don't want people looking at others' character openly. It has to do with covert operations. This, of course, is contrary to the concept of being beyond reproach. According to Cambridge.org, being above or beyond reproach is to not deserve any blame. Basically, it has to do with the idea of history of misconduct. If you do not have a history of misconduct, then you are beyond reproach. And if the history of misconduct that you might have is extremely petty and has been fabricated against you, that also still keeps you beyond reproach. Let's take, for example, I was in the Marine Corps, and you would have a kid who gets NJP'd, which is non-judicial punishment, for some extreme offense that he was alleged to have conducted. And the substantiated evidence for that is that he failed to clean his, clean his room multiple times. Well, the majority of people will look at that and instantly will say that person is being not only railroaded, but they are being um, unfairly treated because the, the punishment and the, the stated history of misconduct does not fit the alleged misconduct that he's accused of actually doing at that time. So the history they're using as the substantiating evidence does not fit. That's similar to the clause in the Constitution where it states that a crime uh, punishment for a crime cannot be cruel nor unusual. And that also has to do with this idea of a history of misconduct. See, today you have all of these people and all these institutions and organizations that have long histories of misconduct, long histories. You got the CIA, which is virtually involved in every nefarious and criminal activity possible. You have all these government officials that have have criminal records, many of them. They, they are always being caught for lying and stuff, and yet they continue through these positions. And one of those main reasons is because in the school system, people are taught not to look at the content of someone's character and that it's a fallacy and that it's something you can't do, despite the fact that asking for people's uh, education credentials when they're talking about a subject is, in fact, the same thing. So, that's interesting. So then we get into this an idea called a setup, where you are building up the excuse for a cover, the untouchable untouchable or beyond reproach scenario but it's you're actually fabricating the beyond reproach scenario rather than living an honorable life you're setting up a situation where somebody is automatically beyond reproach for things that happened in the past it's similar to the idea of a history of misconduct but it actually has to do more with a history of being abused somebody who has a history of being abused is usually going to get Bit more leeway for most people and their actions explained away based off of those past abuses. This relates to the so-called lavender scare, which was, according to Wikipedia, a moral panic about homosexual people in the United States government, which led to their mass dismissal from government service during the mid-20th century. The lavender scare, uh, allegedly 1950. This is all part of the setup of the history of abuses to establish a context of beyond reproach. And this relates to 
a entity that was established later called the Lehi Ho or the Lehi Valley Homophile Organization. Now I have a copy of their constitution, so let's go ahead and look at that. Under Article 1, name, this organization shall be known as the Lay Valley Homophile Organization, Lay High Ho. Here's the interesting part. It doesn't say Lay High Valley. The Constitution says Lay Valley. So on Wik uh, if you Google this organization, it will say Lay High, L-E-H-I-G-H. -H. In the constitutional name, it states L-E-I-G-H. That's somebody running cover for this organization, making it harder to find their documents and things like that. Article 2, Purpose. The purpose of this organization is to formulate and achieve the rightful place in society for the homosexually oriented individual as a first-class citizen and a first-class human being. Naturally, that would mean that others would be put into more secondary classes, because if you're going to have a first class of something, then you're going to have subclasses. Now, the U.S. Constitution specifically forbids this type of classification of human beings. But the classification of human beings plays into an overarching motive that we'll get into later in this video. Section 2. This organization will cooperate with other organizations concerned with furthering the honorable cause. or the No, that's the homophile cause. It is not the purpose of this organization to act as a social group or as an agency for personal introduction. These aims shall be sought by Section 1, informing and enlightening the public, including utilization of publications and mass media, assisting homosexuals in securing their rights, initiating and participating in social action projects. That's your direct action. Part of the establishing the cover that these people need, these specific people need to instigate their corruptions under the a, a particular guise so they're beyond reproach and they can get away with it. They can get away with crimes. That's the purpose of all of this. For specific people to get away with crimes and to have a cover in doing so. Article 4, Membership. All persons of goodwill, 18 years of age or over, who subscribe to the purpose of this organization may apply for membership. No person shall be denied membership because of sex, race, national origin, religious or political belief, or sexual orientation or preference. An applicant for membership will become a member upon submitting our, our application forms and upon payment of dues as provided in the bylaws. These types of people do love their application forms. Section 4, no membership records other than mailing addresses, applications, and necessary records shall be maintained. Any meeting by any person without which persons express permission... No last name shall be reported in the minutes or used in any meeting by any person without which without such person uh, persons express permission. Persons within the same first name shall be distinguished by the addition of an initial or initials. Pseudonyms may be used. A pseudonym is a false name. If they're allowing false names to be used on their membership documents, this provides the perfect situation, obviously using the cover or guise of past abuses that they perpetuated against gay people. This provides them cover so that one individual can become 10 or 100 or even 1,000. That's the purpose. Any pseudonym that can be used any person can make more than one pseudonym, and therefore it creates the perspective that there's more people involved in this group than there actually are. This is a very common tactic, especially has to do with the juridic entities 
which are fake people, but they're corporations and organizations and things like that that are given quote, legal personhood. And naturally, you can have one person that controls, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but 10 juridic entities, therefore greatly amplifying that individual into many individuals. Only the board of directors shall have access to membership records. Under no circumstances shall the membership records or any information therein be dis disclosed to anyone else without the approval of the board of directors. Section 7. Any member who is found not to, to subscribe or support the purpose of this organization or who has breached the security of the organization may be expelled from the organization by two-thirds vote of the members by secret ballot after written notice to him of clear and specific reasons for the expulsion and a full hearing at a meeting of the board if so required or requested. Now, the interesting part of that is that if you have pseudonyms allowed and you have a bunch of people with different pseudonyms, when it's really easy to establish two thirds majority vote by yourself. Section six, uh, eight, no member may act as an agent for the organization without authorization from the board of directors. Article five officers, the officers sh shall be a president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, and there's a bunch of weird X's and stuff there. Looks like it was redacted. All officers shall be elected by the membership annually on the fourth Sunday of April. Appointed by press up plus SOC one. Section two. The officers of this organization may adopt or use pseudonyms when conducting the public affairs of the organization. The membership shall elect by a majority vote via a special election a successor to fill any elective office except that of president, which shall become vacant because of the incumbent shall die, resign, or be unable to serve. The president shall preside at all meetings of the organization and chair the board meetings. The president shall create such committees as he may deem desirable subject to membership approval or the board may direct him to create. Section 5. The vice president shall act in the place of the president whenever the president is absent or unable to serve for as long as such absence or inability may continue. And in the event of the president's death, resignation, or extended inability to serve shall assume the office of president until the next regular election. Section 6. The treasurer shall be responsible for all funds of the organization. He shall make a financial report at all regular meetings and upon at least 10 days notice, whatever other items the board may direct. This is duress. The treasurer shall be bonded. He shall pay all bills. In section 7. The secretary shall keep formal minutes of all meetings. He shall read the minutes to the members of the organization at each meeting. The secretary shall, in the absence of the president or vice president, call the meeting to order and preside over it until the election of the chairman pro temp, which should take place immediately. Section 8. The executive director shall send out proper notices of all called meetings and of other meetings when necessary shall conduct the correspondence of the organization and maintain records thereof and shall assist the board members when necessary. Section 9. The officer may be removed prior to the expiration of this term of office by three fourths vote of the members in attendance by secret ballot after write, written notice to him of clear and specific reasons for his removal and a full hearing at a meeting of the organization if so requested. Now before we get into the board of directors, it is very obvious what this group is. It's a operation to provide cover. It's a covert operation. 
it is running under the guise of the U.S. Constitution and wording that you might find within the U.S. Constitution, which makes this group look a lot like it is copying the U.S. Constitution and following the supreme law of the land. However, there are many things in this group that violate the Constitution because the writers of it do not care about the supreme law and they are in it for their own ends. One of these sections that very clearly violates the Constitution other than the other ones, but the most obvious is this section, Article 6, the Board of Directors. Section 1. The Board of Directors shall consist of the President, Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer, and Executive Director. The Board members shall serve a term of three years. After one year, the Secretary will be replaced by an elected Board member. After two years, the Treasurer will be replaced by an elected Board member. Advisory members may be appointed by the President as needed. The Board may, may be expanded as required. The Board shall meet twice a month, or whenever three Board members so desire, providing all Board members are given written notice. Uh, one week in advance. The Board of Directors sh shall be responsible for the reviewing of working papers of the Society by approving, vetoing, or altering the decisions of a subordinate body as well as reviewing minutes of general meetings, officers, and committee reports. Here's the interesting part is that it notes THE Society, capital S. I thought this was an organization. <laughs> the Board of Directors will legally represent the full membership of the Society signing the initial constitution slash bylaws and has the power to make legal contracts. The board of directors shall act by a majority vote of its members voting except as this constitution or bylaws shall otherwise provide. The majority of the board shall constitute a quorum. Ex-board actions in matters not explicitly reserved to them may be overruled by a two-thirds vote of the members present at the next general meeting. Article 7, Elections and Other ballot, Balloting. An annual meeting is to be held the fourth Sunday in April, at which time officers will be elected. Section 2, Nominations shall be made from the floor at the regular meeting preceding the election, at which time an election committee is to be appointed to determine the qualifications of nominees, to prepare and distribute the ballots, and to receive the ballots and count them. Section 3, Nominees will be introduced to the membership at the general meeting one month prior to the election and each nominee will be permitted to present a short campaign speech. Ballots must be distributed to the membership within reasonable time so that the so that they may be marked and returned by election day election day. Section 5, ballots will be counted in the presence of the membership and kept by the secretary for at least two months after count. Section 6, newly elected officers will assume their duties on the first day of May for a term of one year. Article 8, meetings. Regular meetings shall be held as frequently as shall be provided by a bylaw but not less than once in each calendar month. Special meetings may be called by the President, Board of Directors, and one-third of the members. The members must be notified in writing one week in advance of social meetings. Such notice must state the purpose of the meeting and no something redacted will be taken or any other matter which does not pertain to stated purpose of meeting. Action at any meeting shall be by a majority vote of the members present voting except as otherwise provided by this Constitution or bylaws, Section 3. Article 9, Dues and Finances. Section 1, Dues and other financial assessment of the members shall be established by a bylaw. Section 2, Dues shall not be refunded. Section 3, All checks of the organization shall be signed by the Treasurer of the President and the President. Article 10, Bylaws. This Constitution may be supplemented by the bylaws, except that no bylaw shall have force or effect insofar as it conflicts with this Constitution. That's lifted directly from the U.S. Constitution, where it states that nothing will be construed to, uh, basically, uh, nothing will be construed to uh, contradict anything else or 
something like that. <clears throat> Section 2, amendments or of revisions as required shall be proposed by the membership through a proper motion and placed on a special ballot for the approval by two-thirds of the voting membership. Now, here's the real interesting part in Article 11, Social Services. We shall endeavor to work in the following categories. Counseling, 1. 2. Legal aid. Three, fundraising. Four, political progress or programs, political programs. Five, education. Six, library and research. Seven, publications. Eight, recreational and social activities. So let's get into these categories for a minute. <laughs> the counseling is very obvious. And, and a lot of these things overlap, right? Most of the education counselors in universities probably have some sort of link to this or similar groups, right? It did state earlier that similar organizations were to be worked with. The legal aid is very obvious, especially when you consider all of the alleged prosecutors that we have that like to pick and choose what they are going to hold as a crime. Political programs, that one's also really obvious. It's like the uh, that all of the program, all of the the aids, right? All the legislative aids in the government, all the well, it does say legal aid, but I suppose legislative aid could, in some ways, count in the legal aid category, but it also goes into political programs where you have this this um, program at OSU uh, called the, the PAGE program where they directly take from people at The Ohio State University and those people start working uh, at low levels in the state government and then they move up into the offices of the senators. And so all of the workers in the offices of the senators have all come from the Ohio State University and they've been indoctrinated there. And then number five, education. So they've got all their bases covered when it comes to social behavior modification and social engineering, hence the title social services. Of course, another aspect of social activities that is not directly stated here is travel, tourism, or immigration. So it's no surprise that you find very many petty dictators inside of the immigration services that align in some way with the so-called LGBTQ plus movement. That's the reason why. This plan here, the cover for their criminal activities, is the reason why. They are establishing a beyond reproach scheme so that anybody who holds them accountable for crimes, they can frame it as though they're being persecuted for their preference of social circumstance. Bylaws of Le Hai Ho, Bylaw 1, regular meetings, monthly meetings are to be held the fourth month, fourth Sunday for every month at 2 p.m. Bylaw 2, dues shall be $5 per year. Newsletter subscription to a newsletter shall be $3 per year. By law 3, the fiscal year of this organization, our organization shall be from May 1st to April 31st. Financial records at any time the membership may determine to be a majority vote to the financial records of Lake Hai Ho audited by a certified public accountant. And so all of this is formed up from the base of the university or education system as stipulated in that constitution where the students and all the people that go through these places they are indoctrinated and they're trained in the ways and the purposes of that organization so that their behavior is socially modified in a way that it provides cover to criminal activity and direct violations of the supreme law of the land, the U.S. Constitution. So naturally, you would want to get people at a young age, so that way they would be ignorant enough 
that it doesn't matter what you tell them directly to their face, what evidence you show them, whatnot, they are not going to accept that they are simply a disguise for criminals that really have no regard for the safety laws, rights, or any other concepts or things other than personal gain and that his ed hack actually has nothing to do with the preference at all it has entirely to do with jenning up a cover now the classification of human beings has been well documented in a different sphere but it's still the same scheme replicated in a different way and that has to do with the alleged holocaust and treatment of various people that were put into various different classes. Specifically, of course, the focus is on the Jewish people. Now, here's the reason why. It's yet the same scheme to classify human beings into different positions, directly violating the laws of many places, of course. And they do this so that the individuals that are perpetuating these problems can then hide among the masses of those that they have abused. When it comes to the Holocaust, it was the Jewish leadership, rabbis and people like that, that set up their congregations. And obviously not all of them, because to throw the baby out with the bathwater or to judge someone based off of status would be playing into their game. The important thing is that you must look at violations of law, willful misconduct, history of misconduct, and the character of an individual, not whatever religion they prefer to follow, and not whatever lifestyle they prefer to follow. Because if you look at that, then you're not looking past the facade that's being constructed to provide cover to the villains. One alleged document that provides evidence for this idea of instigation of cover or creating a situation in which you can establish an identity as being beyond reproach so that the corrupt can get away with their crimes because they've fomented this sort of scenario is the protocol of the elders of Zion. According to Wikipedia, it was a fabricated anti-Semitic text purporting to describe a Jewish plan for global domination. The hoax was plagiarized from several earlier sources, some not anti-Semitic in nature. It was first published in Russia in 1903, as translated into multiple language and languages and disseminated internationally in the early part of the 20th century. It played a key part in popularizing belief in international Jewish conspiracy. Distillations of the work were assigned by some German teachers as, if factual, to be read by German school children after the Nazis came to power in 1933. Despite having been exposed as fraudulent by the British newspaper, The Times, in 1921, and the German Frankfurter Zeitung in 1924, it remains widely available in numerous languages in print and on the Internet, and continues to be presented by anti-Semitic groups as a genuine document. It has been described as probably the most influ influential work of anti-Semitism ever written. That last part is possibly the most true statement that they could show. It is, in fact, the most influential work of anti-Semitism ever written, because the way that it's being reported here, it appears that this document was used to establish the label of anti-Semitism. If you have a group of people going around saying that they're Jews, and at the same time they're violating the law and the U.S. Constitution, and they are together formed into a conspiracy, and then you attempt to hold them accountable, they will say you're doing so out of anti-Semitic sentiment, not because they're criminals, but because of their being a Jew. And they obviously have to establish the, that context first by abusing Jews. This is the same idea as Jesuit priests being arrested for carrying prayer, prayer beads and crosses rather than violating sovereign nations, seeking to depose people, causing intrigue and conflict. And, of course, in the case uh, that's coming out today, in many different places, Catholic Church sex abuses in the United States. Apparently, according to the John Jay report from Wikipedia, some, that some 11,000 allegations have been made against 4,392 priests in the USA. This number constituted approximately 4% of the 110,000 priests who had served during the period covered 
by the survey 1952-2002. And of course, if these people were convicted uh, and under a verdict, there would likely be a proliferation of propaganda stating that they had been arrested and were being persecuted for their religious affiliations, as has been done before. Now, the overall motive of the alphabet people, LGBTQ plus stuff, is that plus. What does that plus st uh, mean? What does it cover? So let's get into the concept and meaning of a legal person or meaning the concept of a legal person. The word person, as might be noted, originally means mask. Mask indicates character in play, like a cover. A representative of it. Its origin can be traced back to the word parson, the representative of a church. You get a direct link to a church. But now if talk about a person, it does not merely represent the identity of a man of flesh and blood, but also represents several jural relations. The identity of person must be allocated in many cases from time to time. Generally, there are two types of person which the law recognized, namely the natural and artificial person. Former is confined merely for human beings, while the latter is generally referred to any being other than human being, which the law recognizes having duties and rights. One of the most recognized artificial person is the corporation. Now, here's an interesting note. Why would the necessity for an argument and uh, over-extrapolation with the ultimate objective of removal of the sex or uh, orientation of birth of a human person, why would that need to be such a big deal? Well, a corporation has no sex. It is neither female nor male. It is, as some might say, without gender right so they have to establish all this stuff so that they can get from paperwork removed the word sex the check mark sex the box that states male or female that they need to get rid of that from habit from everything so that way people recognize a corporation as being equivalent to a human flesh and blood person the court system already recognized this, the fraudulent legal court system that we have today. However, the court of public opinion does not. The majority of people do not recognize a corporation building, entity, organization, association, or whatnot as being equivalent to a human person. So that would take a lot of work to get that into the psyche and to the habits, socially speaking, of everyone or at least most people. And this clearly is all based around the so-called alphabet agencies or New Deal agencies. According to Wikipedia, were the U.S. federal government agencies created as part of the New Deal of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The earliest agencies were created to combat the Great Depression in the United States and were established during Roosevelt's first 100 days in office in 1933. And, of course, that correlates with the years that they were ramping up the so-called anti-Semitic situation in Europe. A similar time frame and time of the of the century. And of course the alphabet agencies, if anyone doesn't know, are the ones that have mostly three letters, but many have more, like the USCIS, which is the allegedly stands for the US Customs and Immigration Service. The CBP, the different uh, police departments, right? You got like N NPD, you got LPD, you got all these different designators that use the alphabet, the NSA, CIA, FBI, so on and so forth. And that naturally ties into LGBTQ+. They're part of that plus. The CIA, NSA, all of these different juridic entities, they're all part of the plus in LGBTQ+. This, of course, has to do with the concept of something being transpersonal. The meaning of transpersonal, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary online, is extending or going beyond the personal or individual, say, corporation, group, association, organization, etc. Now, the context of this video, it would be beneficial to look at a book that I wrote the first book that I published, actually, in 2012, when I was just a teenager, 
and I was still in high school. The title of this book is Israeli Fighting, and I wrote it through, through my studies of the Krav Panim El Panim combat uh, style, martial art, whatever, which you could look into. But this part that I'm going to highlight is Chapter 2, Haganah. Most martial arts styles or combat forms of any kind are surrounded by mystery. To understand these different arts, the practitioner must throw out stereotypes and many legends, so they can create falsehoods of what is possible within the art. An example of stereotypical falsehood lies within the Jewish history. The stereotype of weak, unreasonably pacifist Jewish people, created by the wrong perception that because so many Jews died during the Holocaust, they must have freely gone to their deaths at the hand of the Nazis. Whether this is true or not, the Jews being a weak and ignorant people, going like lambs to the slaughter, is false. Many Jews fought against the Nazis, even escaped from concentration camps. This early Jewish resistance movement was known as Haganah. Israeli defense, early Israeli defense. The word Haganah means defense in Hebrew, first used to describe a Jewish fighting force in the early and middle 1900s. The group became the main defense of the Jewish people through the British Mandate of Palestine and the oppression by Hitler and the Nazis. It is Haganah that set up the Palmach and is the main reason the Jewish people are around today. Haganah didn't only describe the Jewish fighting force, but also the style of combat used. Haganah was an early martial art that taught the ability to survive in any situation and train for any situation. The influence of Haganah. Many combat styles and systems alive today were inspired by Haganah. These include most of, if not all, the Israeli martial arts and Russian martial arts. Many Jews inhabited Russia and the country surrounding it, which naturally caused the spread of Haganah into Russian martial arts. The emigration out of Russia and surrounding countries during Hitler's rule, among other factors, caused a split in the already diverse Haganah and inspired the creation of many new styles and combat systems. Now, <clears throat> if you would like a fictional representation of what the ultimate goal and dystopian world of these identitarian, identity state, Rainbow Reich, criminal, uh, covert operatives seek to establish, then please check out my books at the link. There is provided this book, Israeli Fighting, and also the Rainbow Reich. In addition, if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App. And stay tuned, there will be more. Thank you.